Well, good morning and welcome to Faith United Reformed Church. We pray that we will be blessed as we worship and serve our Lord together this morning. A couple of announcements to bring to your attention before we begin our worship. Uh, after services this morning and after a time of coffee, which we invite you to, uh, we're going to try having a hymn sing this morning. Uh, I don't think it's old-fashioned. The church has been doing it for centuries, so I guess it's old, but uh, we get together to sing, sing praise to the Lord, and have a little extra time to do that this morning. So that'll be up here, uh, these pews up here that nobody likes to sit in for some reason. Come up here and sit there. Uh, and we will have a time of singing at 11 o'clock. So uh, if you are able to stay, uh, please do that this morning. Also on Thursday night, we will have our Ascension Day service at 7 o'clock. Uh, we combine that with a prayer day service, so we have a couple of elders and a deacon coming forward to pray with us as well, uh, to hear the promises of that Ascension, uh, as well as to have some ice cream afterwards as a support to the junior high youth group. So uh, make every opportunity to come. Certainly the elders call us for worship uh, on that, which is truly a special day of recognizing Christ's Ascension to his throne and his place at the right hand of the Father. So please join us on Thursday. Thursday at 7. Well, God calls us into his presence this morning in these words from Psalm 106, verse 1. Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. As we meditate on that together this morning, let's bow our hearts in a moment of silent prayer, preparing our hearts for that worship together. Let's stand together. Congregation beloved of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, our help stands in the name of the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. Lift up your hearts to receive his greeting. Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in abundance from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord through the fellowship of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's begin our shared praise this morning under the Trinity Psalter hymnal, the maroon hymnal in front of you, turning number 351. How deep the Father's love for us, that reminder as we begin our worship, number 351, let's sing all the stanzas.
sing in praise then of that deliverer, a deliverer then who presents to us by way of his word not only that recognition of who he is, that he is the God who delivers and saves, but also here is the way you may live out that salvation. And so as we turn in God's will this morning in that word to Exodus chapter 20, that's what we hear again this morning, the reason why we needed someone to pay our ransom, a reference back to that deliverance through the blood of that Passover lamb, that one who is Jesus Christ, who says, this is that way that you might live that blessing before me to the glory of my name. God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. And so this one who has shown steadfast love to thousands of those who love him and keep his commandments brings us back to those two great commandments. You shall love. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor is yourself. That this kind of love is that which reflects the love not only that we've been shown, but the love that our God is. And so as we continue to live out that will together, that is what we give testimony to, the love of God, our response to it in joy and in thanks for what has been shown to us and what we are made together by way of it. And so hear that law and be convinced of your sin, but also then be driven to the Savior who delivers us fully. And so let's sing of that, that loving kindness in the blue Psalter hymnal, number 129, thy loving kindness, Lord, is good and free. Let's remain seated to sing all the stanzas, one, two, nine.
And so we are to live in the presence of a loving God in love. And that call then is a a reminder to us not only of what he's done for us that we might know that love, but the joy of that gratitude of being able to live it and give ourselves to it, of knowing that that's how we not only abide in God, but that's how others will come to know him, that our witness together of our forgiveness and salvation is known in the way that we love. And so we hear this assurance of forgiveness this morning in 1 John chapter 4. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. It's both things, right? We can know God loves us, but do we really believe that? That and becomes important. Not only what he has done, but what he has applied to us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. That if you're still living in grief, if you're still living, even sitting here this morning as one who claims to be in Christ, worried that God is going to smite you for the sins of this week, those things that you've held on for this week or the months or the years that have gone by, you still don't understand the love of Christ. And so be driven again to that this morning. Perfect love casts out fear. Yes, fear God, keep his commandments, but we don't no longer fear judgment. There is therefore now no, now, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We love then, verse 19, because he first loved us. And then that call to us, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he does not love, he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. So the wonder of that gospel drives us again to that law. This is that call for us. That in response to the great love with which we've been loved, we will love the Lord and we will love our brother. And so with that, that knowing that we have a great older brother who has come and done this perfectly for us, that we might know what love is, we can come before an Abba Father in our prayers this morning. And so let's do that together. Let's pray. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are good, that you are holy, that you are blameless and righteous altogether. And that you are a God who not only is this or are these things, but you are a God who reveals yourself to us. And indeed, Father, as a people who love to be able to get out into the beauty of your creation, into the wonder of the fields, into the wonder of the forest, Father, into our yards and into our communities, Father, we give you thanks for the splendor and power that you display. But Lord, we thank you for the understanding that you have given to us of these things that can come only by way of your word. And so we thank you this morning for that special revelation that you have made yourself known plainly and clearly, authoritatively, Father, in great promises that are yes and amen in your Son, Jesus Christ. That you have given us that law to convince us of our sins, but to drive us to the Savior, to great promises, Lord, that you always keep, to gospel good news found in your Son, in the one that you have sent, the greatest evangel and good news that we can know. And you send us forth then, Lord, not only with a message, but a life, to be lived of love to the glory of your name. And so, Father, in response to that word, we give you thanks that you are a God faithful to every one of those promises and to every bit of that love that you have recorded for us in the scriptures. And yet, Father, as we sit here this morning, we might be struggling with that message. 
in knowing what is going on in our lives, how can you be showing love even in those things? Father, it's hard for us to remember your word, your promises, and your love when we're hurting or grieving, when we're wandering, when we're confused, when we wonder what is going on and how can you be brought glory through it. But Father, our hearts go out to those in the community of Gaylord who have experienced the power of a tornado, who have endured much loss, who grieve the loss of a life, who have endured injuries. And so, Father, as they sit and they look around themselves, Lord, how are you glorified in these things? How are you good? How are you loving? And so, Father, in great traumatic experiences like that, or just in the daily discouragements or disappointments that we endure, there are times where it's hard to remain rooted in your truth and in your love. But to that end, Father, we give you thanks that in your wisdom you made one day in seven a day holy and set apart, a day of rest, a day that you have committed to worship. We thank you for bringing us back each week, we pray each day, to your word and to your promises. And so we thank you in this day for new morning mercies, that the darkness of the night is consumed by the light of the morning. And for the multitude of ways that you show us that you are faithful and kind in love, in the ways that you provide for us, but also, Lord, in the love and the faithfulness and the ministry of others, that we can be encouraged as we are gathered together as a church to be mindful that in my struggles or in your joys and in everything that we share in between, we do that together. We do that as we love each other, as we support each other and encourage each other. And so would you continue to care for us in the love and the ministry of others today. For Father, we need that care and we need that love. We think of it in the context of our world and of our country. Father, from the war in Ukraine to unsettled politics and and struggles and inflation in this country, Father, of a decision we pray would be rendered appropriately by the highest court in the land tomorrow. And yet, Father, also the grace then to work in compassion and to speak and to live love and to to what will take place after that. Lord, care for our world and country by the power of your word, a word worked in your people. Care, Father, for the ministry of the church in days where the evil one would love to see us scattered and shepherds scattered, shepherds broken and fallen and gross sins. Lord, in congregations that struggle as they sin against each other or deal with the sins of this world, Father, would you be at work in your bride to make her beautiful and to gather her to yourself? Father, we pray that you would care for the ministry of our church, that, Lord, you would bless the preached word, that you would bless the work of our elders and deacons, that you would establish the work of each of our families and the love and the kindness and the grace of your word. Father, would you be at work? Father, for the ministry of our churches this week, we pray, thanking you not only for our federation, but especially for our classes. And so as we gather on Tuesday for the responsibility of of administering a candidacy exam to Mr. Koskin, we ask, Lord, that you would be near unto him. Lord, as one who has come here from Turkey, who has learned and desires to go back into that land in the power of the gospel, would you uphold the brother in his studies in that anxiety and nervousness that ultimately comes in preparing for these exams, would you meet him, his wife, his children? And Lord, would you bless the Walker congregation as they uphold him, not only in prayers, but in their support and their encouragement. And so would you bless us in the unity that we share as churches together. And Father, would you bless then and care for our church and its members in the love that you provide, not only from your word, in your working of sovereignty, but also in the care of our members one to another. And so, Lord, would you continue to be near to Cal and Jane, to Ken, Lord, we're thankful that he could be here this morning, for Elaine, continue to be near to Pauline and and Case and Dora. Father, we pray for Ron and Ruth as they make transition to a new place to live, would you be near to them? Father, for Avery, continue to strengthen her and and raise her up, Lord, in your blessing. For each of our widows and widowers, Lord, be near to them today. Lord, may they know your nearness, may they know the nearness of our body together. And Father, for your word, because that word is that which we have to give to each other. That word is that out of which we love each other, and we bring that encouragement, and we continue to bring each of us together hand in hand 
back to the wonder of the love of Jesus Christ. And so may that word today have its work among us in love. And would you reveal yourself loving and faithful in your word to us anew this day. And so, Father, your promise never fails. Your word is never not true. You will continue to, to proclaim it, that we would know it and love it and live it and rest in it. And so, Father, may we rest in that word today. In your faithfulness and love, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's prepare our hearts to receive that reminder in his word this morning from the Black Hymnal, the Hymns of Grace Hymnal, turning number 181. 181, his robes for mine. Let's stand to sing all the stanzas, 181.
It's an amazing love that we've been blessed with, a love that we speak of then this morning in terms of our identity as well as in what is promised for us in the book of Jude. And so I'd ask that you turn there, Jude, just Jude, (laughs) turning to verse 16, or 17, excuse me, taking for our text verse 17 through the end of the book. If you're visiting with us, we worked our way through that first half last week in that call to contend for the faith. You can find that sermon on our YouTube page or on sermon audio But moving then today to keeping ourselves, keep yourselves in the love of God, that command here that comes by way of God's word. So let's hear that word. Jude, verse 17, hear now the word of the Lord. But you, y'all, must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they said to you in the last time, there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It's these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Amen. Thus far the reading of God's holy word. Our Father and our God, we pray that as we come to understand more of that great love with which you have loved us in your Son, Father, would we be those committed to keeping ourselves in that, knowing your work, knowing your promise, knowing your word, and knowing the call of that word then that is placed upon us. And so, Father, as we open that this morning, we pray that you would bless the words of my mouth, that you would bless the meditations of our spirit, that they would all be pleasing to you, and that you would be brought all the glory and praise as our rock and our redeemer, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Beloved congregation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in the Lord's call through the words of Jude to contend for the faith once delivered or once for all delivered to the saints, to understand the days that we live in, to recognize the sins of the ungodly and the woe and judgment that is coming for blasphemers and scoffers, that message is one we need to give ourselves to. And so I certainly encourage you to that review of the first 16 verses of the book of Jude, but but there's still more for us. And so in that call to contend, we fight to take every thought captive. We contend for the prize, for the upward call of Jesus Christ. The prize for that faith which God has made known to us, that faith which saves us. But sometimes that contending doesn't go so well. And sometimes some of those battles are ones that we lose. Sometimes we fall short. Sometimes we become discouraged when the fighting is long, discouraged and weary when the fighting is fierce. And so in hearing that call to contend last week, we we rise up and we rally ourselves and we muster up every bit of, of that last bit of courage and strength we have left. And we go out into the week to fight. But we find ourselves back here. And maybe it went well and maybe it didn't. But do you remember what we're contending for? Do you remember why we fight that fight in the first place? Do you remember why we come together even here in this place? Do you trust that you're going to have what's promised in victory? You see, that's why we need to contend. Because it's that, right? As much as we look outside or we look at scoffers or or we look at malcontents and grumblers, that fight is, is for that faith and to have that prize that we long for. And so we must give everything to keep ourselves in the love of God because multiply mercy and peace and love is our promise and salvation is the prize. And so that's what's recorded for us in that faith, once for all delivered to the saints. That very thing serves to the praise of our God forever and ever. And that's worth contending for. But that's also worth keeping. 
It's a love worth keeping and holding on to as well. And the purpose of that contending and keeping is the glory of our God and of our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And so the morning, this morning, as we conclude our study of the book of Jude, we see this. The beloved of God are urged to keep themselves in the love of God under the glory of God. And they do this as a people more committed to his word remembering, to his way building, and to his work depending. A word remembering, a way building, and a work depending. But it starts with his word remembering, which is not just a ripoff of last Sunday night's sermon, but it comes before us again today. And so to do that, we must remember that we're called to a fight, but also given great promises and gifts to do that. And so what we need to first do is remember the word. Verse 17, but you must remember that in all of the book of Jude, this is the first imperative. This is the first command word that Jude has used in the letter. And there's intensity to it. Remember because the false teachers have forgotten my word. Remember my word and what it says about your identity in Jesus Christ. We have to remember. Otherwise, that fight and that struggle makes us bitter. If we don't know what we're fighting for, if we don't know what we're contending for, what's the use? Why do we give that effort? We can become bitter and discouraged and contending for the once for all delivered faith. And so do you remember, brothers and sisters, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ? Because we do get discouraged, right? As those who get discouraged about the days we live in, the sinfulness of sinners, the perversions of grace, seen in matters of sensuality, ungodliness, grumbling, discontent, boasting, and the like, Jude is basically saying to us, why does this surprise you? Why, why are you surprised by any of this? Remember what the word says concerning your fight. Verse 18, they said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. That's what they told you. Apostasy will happen. Suffering for the truth will come. The prophets and apostles told you. 2 Peter 3, remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. Paul says it to Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate teachers for themselves. To do what? To suit their own passions. And will turn away from listening to the truth. And will wander off into myths. Brothers and sisters, remember. Remember that scoffers hate the word. They hate matters of faith. They hate any call to faithfulness and holiness. And not only that, but they're going to scoff at you too. They're going to scoff at your trust. They're going to scoff at your hope. They're going to scoff at your insistence on the truth and the authority of the scriptures. They're going to scoff at your inability and unwillingness to affirm the values of this world. They're going to scoff at your old-fashioned faith. They're going to scoff at your supposed puritanical walk. They're going to scoff that you don't live in the freedom that is theirs. But what do we know? Verse 19, it is these who cause divisions. Worldly people devoid of the Spirit. Remember who they are, and then remember this. You are not them, and you are not to be like them. They're the opposite of what you're called to be. It is scoffers versus the beloved. This isn't just intermingling. No, no, no. This is side. That was back in Jude 4, right? They cause divisions because they believe they're elite. They're better. They're more faithful. Let's divide the body because we won't submit ourselves to the truth. They're arrogant, excluding themselves from the body because they believe themselves to be something. And all they do, all they do in that way is show themselves to not have any of the spirit at all. Remember the word. 
Remember who you are and what they are. And then remember, what does that word call us? Call me, call you, call the church to contend for. Remember it in what Paul says to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, command, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to all the word of his grace which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among those who are sanctified. That is what we keep ourselves in. You keep yourselves in that kind of love as one of his beloved, one who holds fast to the truth and to the promise of his word in your remembering. And so remember that. And also then in that way, be built up. And that in the second place in verses 20 to 23. It starts in verse 20. But you, you all, beloved, what you are, building yourselves up in your most holy faith. Yes, we need to remember, but we also need to be building. We're not just looking back. We don't just look at a word and it's con. What does this have to work now? What is this building in me and in us now? We need to build. And we need to do that because we are in need of the abundance of the love and the grace and the mercy found in the promises of God's word. We need that. And so we contend with that. We contend with the sword of truth. We contend with the most holy faith delivered us in his word, that which is our food for spiritual life, that which builds us up, that which works in us a fire of love and service. It's about his word. And so we, brothers and sisters, need to be a people building ourselves up together in that word. So heed that call to study it and to give yourselves to it in worship. It was the first play of the early church, Acts 2, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And that too is the way of building his way. Build yourselves up praying in the Holy Spirit. Because you see, as we give ourselves to that word, and many of you say that, I, I don't always understand what it says. So then what do you do? You should pray about it. And so a conviction in that word drives us to a need of prayer. And that life of prayer and fellowship and communion with the Lord drives us again, back again and again to our need for that word. You see, no contending or building in our midst can happen apart from the powerful working of his word and spirit. There's no other way, no other program, no other thing that we do. That's the thing. You see, our praying for our lives and the life of the body is a vital means of building. In fact, I appreciated this in Green's commentary. He writes, quote, to outrun the scriptures and prayer is to outrun Christianity altogether end quote. Because by giving ourselves to the scriptures and to the prayer, we heed the command of verse 21, which is the sweetness of this text. Keep yourselves in the love of God. In fact, everything branches from there in the structure that is written here. That becomes, as it were, kids, the white stuff in the middle of the Oreo. This is the sweetness. That's the heart of the command. What God has done, that great indicative back in Jude 1, is this. You're beloved in the Father and kept for Jesus. That's what he does. But now this is his command. This is his imperative to you. His call to respond is this. Remain in the love of God. Persevere and grow in the love of God. Pay attention constantly to that relationship first. And so, brothers and sisters, think about it like keeping up a house or a property that's been given to you. I mean, that would be super nice, right, as some of our young ones go to buy houses today. Somebody gives you a house. Somebody gives you property, right? What do you do with it? Well, it's, it's now yours, and nothing's going to change that, but you care for it. Why? Because it's precious, 
because you're thankful, because you want the wonder and the beauty of that thing that you have been given to shine through. We're given the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's never going to be removed. So we live in that love, and we seek to adorn it. We keep it, and we think about it often, so it stays ever before us, even as that prize is before us as those waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. That in that we build ourselves up, living out of hope and patience in the now, but also out of longing for the future. And so keeping ourselves in such love and building up our lives in that way drives us to show mercy, to call others to the gift and to the salvation that is ours found only in Jesus Christ. In fact, instead of responding to scoffers with scoffing or dismissing, Instead of responding to those who afflict us or persecute us in anger, those who hate us, what do we respond with? We respond in faith and hope and love, which is what Jude has just laid out for us in his teaching. That's how you respond. You respond in mercy because you needed mercy too, right? Don't sit here this morning thinking you don't. We needed mercy. And so those living in ungodliness and in scoffing need mercy too to be rescued from their sin and darkness. And so as we wait for the mercy of our Lord, verse 22, have mercy on those who doubt. That mercy is more than than just pity, more than judgment. It's an engagement in the matters of their doubt that we overcome error with the truth of the word of God in the working of the Holy Spirit. It says in James 5, 19 and 20, my brothers, if anyone among you wanders, and that's the sense of this word here, wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. We work to save others, verse 23, by snatching them out of the fire. Someone caught in a fire doesn't just need our watching, doesn't just need our pity, They need our action. Those left in the reality of hellfire judgment need to be told about what is coming, what they are enduring, but also about how they are rescued, the only way of rescue. Turn to the Lord in repentance and faith. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. This is our heart together. That is how we wait in mercy. Because we needed that work to intervene too. And so do they. To others, show mercy with fear. And so we show mercy as what? As those who fear God in dependence upon the completed work of Jesus Christ for our salvation. A dependence upon His Spirit to lead us into all truth. But we are to show that mercy with proper fear concerning situations where they might be so broken in ways that could be a pitfall to us. That in reaching the lost, we might not show care, and so we lose sight of our hope and fall into the same sins. So fear God in humbling yourself to his help, in seeking the help of others in your contending and building. And in that way, we will build up and keep ourselves in the love of God, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. And you're like, well, what does that hating look like? Hate every garment, every one that people cling to as their righteousness. Hate it. Isaiah 64, 6, we have all become like one who is unclean. All our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. Hate that. Hate that which is stained in the work of sin, the flesh, and the devil. Why? Because the Lord hates it. These are the things that he hates. He's changed our clothes. What a glorious exchange. And so we pray that he will change others' garments too in Christ Jesus. It's the prophet's hope in Zechariah 3. Now Joshua was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you and I will clothe you with pure vestments. What a hope to be built up in. 
And in that, we are built up in love and in thanksgiving for what is shown to us in his mercy. That as we recognize what we've been clothed in, we are encouraged. And we're built up to what? To rejoice. Isaiah 61.10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. And he has covered me with a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. That's abundant mercy. That's what Jude is driving us to. But it is that abundant mercy that also drives us to grateful and careful obedience. At kids, sometimes you might have, and maybe we don't do it as much now, but when I was a kid, there was that set of clothes that were those Sunday best. And you got home from church, and you had to hang them up again, and then you brought them out for church, and then you hung them up again. You had to keep it nice, right? And you can't run out in the mud, and you can't do other. They have to stay clean. Well, what Jesus Christ has given to us is something way better than Sunday best. And so in Christ, Jude is really exhorting us, keep your clothes clean. Don't soil his garments. You've been given a great and a glorious exchange. Don't forsake that gift you've been given, but instead build yourself up in his way. Rejoice in what you've received in Christ and live that out. Even knowing that when we do stain it, or get mud on it, we can depend on Christ to clean it again as we depend on his work and that in the last place because living a life of his work depending is a life lived in doxology. That we will depend upon our God for our salvation and all things for his glory. And so we're going to contend for salvation and for faithfulness and for truth. We're going to keep ourselves in the love of God. We're going to keep ourselves from sin. But why? Don't just get fired up to do these things because if you do that, you're going to seek to do it in your own strength. And you're going to fall short and you're going to become discouraged and you're going to be bitter. We keep ourselves from sin. Why? So we would have what we long for. We want salvation. We want that last day to come. But it's more than just that. If that's all you're concerned about, that kind of works righteousness is going to start pouring out of your mouth. Why do we contend against sin? Why do we build ourselves up in that faith and in that love? For the glory of God. That's what this contending is all about. That's what this keeping is all about. All the ways that we seek to glorify Him and enjoy Him is not work that we ultimately can or will take and receive credit and praise for. The victory is his. Everything in this book that we are given is his. All of it is gift. The victory is his. The good works are his for which he has prepared beforehand that we would walk in. We share in a victory as good soldiers doing our duty, faithful servants fulfilling the task that we were created for, runners who finish a race that he has set before us. The victory is his. The glory for all of it is his. And so we depend upon him for all things concerning our salvation and eternal life. So our voice is to, our life is to give voice to his glory. And that's the power of how verse 24 begins, because we're instantly humbled again. Humbled to rightly praise him for all of it. Verse 24, now to him. It's always been about him. It always will be about him. He is the one upon whom we depend for love and salvation in all things. And that's why so many familiar doxologies run back to the same. Romans 16, 25, Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages. Ephesians 3, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to his power at work in us, to him be glory in the Christ, in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. But after all that Jude has made plain, our place in the church and the contending that's going to go on in it and the building that needs to happen even among us, what glory is praised first? What's to be a first comfort to us? Verse 24, now to him 
who is able to keep you from stumbling. And you're like, that's it? (laughs) That is it. That is it. In verse 21, we read that we're to keep ourselves in the love of God by giving attention to it, for watching for more of it. But if that was left to your own will and your own power, you would fall away. Thank the Lord. Glorify the Lord that he keeps you from stumbling. Because our God will not let that happen. He keeps us which is a different word here than in verse 21. Because there, keep is give attention to, right? But here, keep means protect. We depend upon him to protect us, to protect the church, to protect our hearts, to protect our faith, to protect us in all things concerning our perseverance and preservation in grace. What a blessing. Because in the midst of our struggle against sin, the flesh, and the evil one, we can trust, Lord, you will protect me. And you will present us blameless before the presence of your glory. And in that day, according to his word, every knee will bow. And he will call us out. And he will lift us up to stand as his children and heirs in Jesus. And we will be made spotless and given the robes of forever righteousness in him. We're going to be brought before our Abba Father in and through our Savior as his children and brought into his glory to share in it forever. And that presentation will bring us before him with great joy, with exceeding joy. But whose joy is it first? See, as we hear that doxology, we think us. That's our joy. Look at it again. First is the joy of the Lord. This is the Father's joy, that his joy is known most powerfully in the redemption and glorification of his chosen people found in Christ. And in that joy, we will be made to share in the fullness of that together with all of the saints. And we're going to speak it out. Revelation 19, then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us all together rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and her bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure the fine linen, the righteous deeds of the saints. It is all his joy that we will share in, and it's all his glory. Verse 25, to the, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is only one, only one who will receive all the glory, only one who will receive the glory in the work of his Son, And we are those whom that work has been applied to in and through Jesus Christ. To him be all the glory. That which belongs to a great creator in the midst of all of his redeemed and glorified splendor. To him be all the majesty which belongs to the greatest king of kings and the Lord of lords. To him be all the dominion which belongs to an all-knowing, all-powerful ruler who is good and wise and kind forever. To him be all the authority which belongs to the only one who can work all things in providence according to his perfect will. That God, to him belongs all the glory and he is worthy. Worthy not only of our praise, all of our praise, but all of our dependence. All of our dependence upon him whose work is complete and completely able to keep us, protect us, and deliver us into that glory. And so, yes, contend. Contend and keep contending for the faith with that kind of glory before you. 
Keep yourself in the love of God as part of that bride who has given you that salvation and who will make you to share in that glory. To him be all the glory before all time, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your word and the comfort of it and the wonder of that love that you call us to keep ourselves in. And Lord, we're not able to do that apart from you. None of that contending, none of that building, none of that keeping can be done apart from you and your work and your word and your way. And so, Father, keep us there, not in ignorance, not leading others astray, not resting in self-righteousness, not being scoffers and malcontents, divisive, but, Father, driven to this word and to this way and to that desire for that glory. And so, Father, would all the glory for our service, for this word, for our sacrifices of praise, for our offerings that we bring, for the the facilities of this church that we might do the work of the church. Father, would you bless it, and would you be glorified in all of it, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, the deacons will come forward and collect our morning offering. And this morning's offering, as you read, for our furnace fund, for some of the replacement of the furnaces in our fellowship hall, in our gymnasium. And so might the Lord be praised with cheerful giving. sing of our God's love together out of the Trinity Psalter, hymnal number 431. And can it be that I should gain amazing love? How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Let's stand to sing stanzas one, three, and four. Then we'll hear God's benediction and then leave your books open. We'll use stanza five as our doxology. But stanzas one, three, and four, number 431. Let's stand to sing.
Go out into this day assured of the Lord's parting blessing. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen.